and it's a point of time in which uh, humans value digital assets uh, more than physical assets. Ronkin Gaurav, a real pleasure to host this session. Phil um, endured many conversations with me earlier this year and has recovered sufficiently that he's come back to chat to us. Wow. Uh, wow. So it's brilliant to have Phil back again. Uh, Phil is recording this live from Taiwan today. So thank you, Phil. Um, let's kick thank off you by for having me. tell us, not at all, anytime. Phil, kick us off by telling us a little bit about the journey you've had into the world of emerging technology. Uh, it's a multi decade journey now. How did you get involved in that space? Many, many moons ago, you weren't. Uh, involved in the bleeding edge of technology, you were doing various other things as a young man, as in his young student. So talk us through that journey from theology college to the cutting edge of tech. Wow, you want to go that far back, huh? <laughs> um, in yeah, two minutes. <laughs> I would say, that. <laughs> go, go, I would say my, my first startup idea came when I was building schools for girls in Afghanistan. Uh, I was I was working for a, you know a social organization. I just found it very inefficient. I was raising money and building schools. You know I was in uh, um, Kunduz, which is a north uh, east of Afghanistan, and I just felt like, hey, there must be some type of technology. And you know back then there was this new technology called e e ink. Um, and then long story short, I started this organization called One Library for a Child, where the vision is. If I built this device and I gave this device to a child, well, they would have uh, access to, you know, a library. And so the device was called Alex, which is, you know, named after the Library of Alexandria. Um, anyways, long story short, that was, you know, uh, the, the rise to that was sold to Barnes and Noble, uh, and then Barnes and Noble shipped the, the nook with that. That's how I got into. Uh, and then uh, I guess the lucky part was we were also one of the first to use this. Uh, open source mobile operating system, you know, and which turns out to be Android. Uh, then I joined HTC and then I built the first Android phones there. Uh, I was lucky enough to, you know, be shipping and building Android phones from 2007 to 12. You know, during my time there, I shipped over 100 million phones there um, and, and just really saw how mobile changed people's lives. I mean, I saw not just people's lives change, but society changes, you know, the whole conversation around you know, politics, you know. And so tech became this edge case thing to now mainstream, to now, you know, the main thing that politicians and government and, you know, uh, people in, you know, banking talk about. And so, yeah, that's how I kind of stumbled into startups and into into mobile. And so I, I was like, uh, I had like front row seats into seeing how mobile would really change people's lives. Zoom forward to so the world we're in, or maybe entering soon. Level set for the audience. How would you define the concept metaverse and particularly open metaverse? Well, I mean, you know, uh, I'll back up a bit. Like we you know, um, 2013, 14, you know, I started HTC's first kind of corporate venture arm and I was looking for the next growth device. Um, you know, 2007 to 12, HTC was going this, and 12, 13, we were actually going the other way down, and I was looking for the next product, you know, and then again, I, I, I stumbled onto, you know, virtual reality, you know, and that was the seeds of, uh, of the HTC Vive, and, um, and this time around, when I, when I, uh, uh, in virtual reality, you know, I, I started, uh, instead of being operational, I started a fund uh, um, called Presence Capital, which is a kind of niche uh, vertical sector based fund. Um, and it was a VR, AR focus fund, right? Um, I do have to say that, you know, VR, AR, you know, since 2015 and then now fast forward announced, now it's suddenly been called Metaverse, right? Uh, the Metaverse, of course, was coined by, it's not really coined, but it's kind of, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's rebranding of it. And so I, I guess the simple way to explain is just this rebranding of VR, AR. Um, 
And, you know, so I guess the way Mark and, you know, Matthew Ball, he thinks that they define it as kind of the next internet that's persistent and immersive and decent in nature. I mean, I like to define it in a very different way that I think encapsulates both the concept of the metaverse and also Web3. Um, and I, I, I like to think of it as a point in time in human history. And it's a point of time in which uh, humans value digital assets uh, more than physical assets, you know? And I like that definition because it's a point in time. Plus it encapsulates the Web3 concept of, you know, the whole concept of, you know, the ownership economy, right? Uh, Web3 being that space where you want to own digital assets and metaverse is that time in which digital assets become more and more valuable, right? And the important, and so like, I felt like that was a much, much more robust understanding of, you know, the metaverse, the Web3 was going on in that space. And so that's, that's really kind of the direction of how I think about it instead of kind of the technical aspects of, of the metaverse, which of course is true. Um, you know, whether it's avatars, immersiveness, or persistence, you know, things that are, even presence, which is, you know, the name of my fund that I started in 2015. Um, but yeah, I, I think high level, I, I think that's a much more robust way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about this point in time, this point in history we are in, digital assets are slowly becoming more important than physical assets and we can definitely see that with the younger generation like for those of us who have children this is not a theoretical discussion we know it's a lived discussion where kids particularly the kind of 8 to 12 demographic or maybe even 5 to 15 demographic would rather get an in-app purchase way above getting a physical toy very different to 20 30 years ago so Think about defining the size of this market as it's going to evolve in the next couple of years. So is this going to be gamers and gaming console driven? So a few hundred million people? What stage do we get to, you know, the 5 billion or so unique internet users there are today in the world? How, how quickly, what does that trajectory look like, that J-curve, if you like? Yeah, I would just say there's a few ways to, to, to size this market. I think one, as you mentioned, like the 13 year old and under has been the roadblocks of this world, right? I would say maybe the, the 16 to 21, like the four nights of this world. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask that group of people from 10 to 20, for example, you know, what do you want for Christmas, right? You know, they're not gonna you know, tell you, oh, I want, I don't know, an LV jacket or even Air Jordans anymore. They you know, they want an artifact, you know, uh, a Nike shoe. They want, you know, the LeBron James uh, Fortnite skin, right? They want some Roblox digital virtual item, right? And so I, that's one way to think about it. I, I think in this, um, um, in these virtual worlds or metaverses, Roblox being one, Fortnite being another one. Um, but then beyond gaming, I, I think, you know, of course, Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, I think both added together are, I think, close to half a uh, half a trillion uh, dollars worth of, of, of assets. I mean, that's, that's, of course, considered a digital asset, right? And so, yeah, I think all those added together, those points to trillion dollar markets for sure. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and of course, you know, Roblox, Fortnite, these are the kind of the huge platforms. Um, and so... Uh, obviously, Roblox and Fortnite is gaming, but you know Bitcoin and Ethereum being public blockchain, then you know it's about you know money, it's about finance, you know decentralized finance, it's about artworks, NFTs, things of that nature. And so, yeah, I think that's 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 yeah, you know, that's a, that's one way to kind of gauge the the size, you know, the total market size. What's going to be the driver of the takeoff as it goes towards more mass adoption? What are the either content uh, hooks uh, with games or social? Or what's going to be the content hooks? And then what's going to be the device, the hardware, the stepping stones? Obviously, we'll come on to more in hardware in a second. We've been quite closely involved in that space. What do we need to happen on those two fronts, like the catalyst, if you like, in the next two, three, four years? I think, um, you know, the main concept of well, Web3 is 
is ownership, right? If you heard, I think what we've all heard, web one is, you know, read, web two is read and write, web three is, you know, owning your digital assets. I think the thing to, to really consider is, I mean, imagine all these, uh, um, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, right? All these content creators are creating content. Um, and, you know, different platforms take a different percentage, right? Um, but imagine a world in which, you know, there is the equivalent of a YouTube or TikTok in which the user actually completely owns uh, their identity. They can, they can switch platforms. They can port their identity from one place to the other. I mean, you're already seeing so many people investing in their own content. Mm -hmm. I think when you change that incentive, when people really truly understand that they're owning their followership, they're owning their content, they're owning their they're having sort of uh, the power to change their own destiny. You're gonna you're gonna see ten x and hundred x sort of investment in this content. And so, yeah, I I I, I see that. I mean, that incentive, I mean, show me the incentive and I'll, I'll show you the behavior, right? That, that incentive change in terms of ownership is, it, it really is a monument, mount monumental change uh, in, in the way the next generation thinks about uh, the content in which they create. Um, I think in terms of hardware, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't, I think, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I have, a kind of a bigger um, <clears throat> opinion, not so much about the, the consumer facing the device, but the fundamental infrastructure uh, from a hardware perspective. And, you know, my, my perspective is on this is, is um, it's actually down to the chip level, you know, actually being in Taiwan, being, you know, the heart of, you know, almost, uh, you know, the reason why there's peace here is, is a company called TSMC, right? We're at the heart of, you know, uh, the semiconductor world in Taiwan, but uh, in the world, right? Um, I think uh, there needs to be a type of chip and I, I, I call it the SBU, Secure Processing Unit, a chip that is designed um, fundamentally for privacy and ownership. You know, I think a lot of, you know, uh, the, the hardware that's designed today is all using off the shelf chips uh, that is not designed for the, for the Web3 era, right? I think what I shipped back in 2018 with the HTC Exodus, which is a hardware wallet built into a phone, you know, was the first instance of empowering the user to own their private keys. Um, and, you know, as we can see in, in the recent kind of exchange uh, collapses, right? People can, lose everything right if if you don't own your keys right when your keys are in the cloud and own in the web two sense right a very cloud-centric model that's it's uh it, it is very dangerous right and as more again in the metaverse sense of that the, the 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 definition of as digital assets become more and more valuable there's even more incentive uh, uh for hacks right um and so um, there then becomes, it becomes that much more important to protect these digital secrets, right? Um, and hence encryption along with, you know, a, a hardware chip that's, that's designed from the ground up to protect um, this digital secret becomes that much more important. And so I think that's the most important technology for the next 10 years. And I also think Taiwan is the best place to do that. Um, and Taiwan will continue to play that crucial, critical role in the global stage of, mm -hmm. of semis. Um, and I think that if you think about kind of the history of computing, um, you know, uh, I, I think of, of course, the first generation being CPUs, right? General purpose computing. I think the last 10, 20 years, because of the rise of gaming and AI, uh, you saw the rise of GPUs. And I think once we head into this thing called a metaverse, uh, when ownership and security and privacy becomes the most important thing, um, you'll see the rise of, uh, you know, this thing I call the SPU. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we're, 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 we're in the early innings of, of this, but 
um, more and more so, uh, this becomes of critical importance for uh, if this Web3 theme were to happen. Can I ask you two follow on questions before handing over to Garo to dig into some more details? SPU, I get conceptually what you're saying, but can you unpack it a little bit more for the audience? What exactly is the SPU? And then secondly, you said, if this Web3 thing happens, and so you've given us the drivers in terms of the ownership of content, of a content creator and the, the value of decentralization, um, which is again being brought out this week with centralized, unregulated companies or likely regulated companies blowing up. Um, What's the kind of major hurdles or obstacles for Web3 as a thing to happen, so to speak? Um, because obviously the marketing narrative is, by calling it Web3, we're just saying almost like a teleological, we had Web1, Web2, so it's inevitable. But what are the big sort of challenges or hurdles? So two things, one specific on the chip. And yeah, the I think I, it's, 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 it's this whole, um, I mean, well, Web2 Web gave to the right. You know, Web2 gave rise to the companies of Amazon, Google, right, mm. Facebook, Twitter, Netflix. And if you think about all of these uh, services that you use, right, you use WhatsApp on a daily basis, Facebook, IG, uh, YouTube, and you think about your identity on that, on, on those, right? You, you own none of that identity, right? Which is why, say, Twitter can block you. You're, you can be censored, right? Um, you can be locked out of your Gmail. And, and right, um, in, that, in a sense, or not in a sense, you factually, you do not own your own identity on the internet. None of us do, right? We are borrowing our own identity um, in that sense. And so um, what Bitcoin came to do, right, was introduce, you know, this concept of a private key, right? Now this private key needs to be in sole ownership and custody of the individual, right? It cannot, you cannot have a private key in the cloud and still have ownership of this private key. It needs to be a secret that only you and that individual, the sovereign individual has to own, right? And so um, short of that, Web3 will be, is gonna have a very difficult time um, um, happening. Although there's a lot of uh, um, new public blockchains, zero knowledge proofs that are trying to push ahead you know, a, a, a blockchain that's decentralized, you know, scalable and, and secure, um, there really needs to be a hardware uh, a design that allows one to own and protect and manage their own private keys in a, in a very easy and secure manner, right? And so it really is, is, is an opposite way of thinking of, of Web2, right? This whole like cloud-centric model needs to be completely flipped on its head um, where all those cloud powerful things you could do in a centralized manner, that power needs to give, be given to the individual, right? Um, and, you know, on the chip level, none of, none of that was, none, none of us thought of that before, right? Uh, until now, and, and that chip needs to be completely redesigned uh, in a sense, um, or not in a sense, it completely does need to be uh, redesigned to empower the user to, to own their private keys to, to, to secure that, right? Um, and everything's built on, on top of that. Your, your identity, like I said, right? You don't own your Facebook or your, your Instagram mm -hmm. or your Twitter identity. That identity, if it's based on a private key that you own, right? It's not something that, uh, you know, a third party company owns, which is why when you hear Bitcoin people talk about it's open, it's public, it's, it's censorship resistant, right? Um, it's decentralized. These are all fundamental features of, of, of you know, the, the Web3 vision, right? There is no ownership if you don't own your private keys. That's just, that's a simple fact, right? Like you cannot own your digital content if your private keys are in an exchange or in some cloud server, right? You cannot own a piece of a movie. You can rent it from Netflix, sure, but that right can be taken away from you, uh, you know, in, 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 in whatever terms that they set, right? And so, 
Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but that, that's kind of the, the high level. It, it does come down to, you know, this ownership of a private key, right? Um, hence, you know, and this this whole rhetoric of, you know, not your keys, not your coin, which is, you know, a very Bitcoin kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rhetoric is, is mm -hmm. you know, I would, I would say the, you know, the whole Bitcoin uh, ideology is one of the most important ideologies out there to, uh, to for this Web three dream to really be realized, I'm going to hand over the next part of the call, uh, the podcast, to my friend Gaurav, and then we'll circle back with maybe a few final questions at the end from myself. So, Gaurav, over to you. Thanks so much, brother. Really, really, really interesting to to you know <clears throat> really be talking about the fundamentals of what's happening here from a hardware point of view, from a from a security point of view, from an identity point of view. And, you know, we've been talking about all these all these fundamentals. And the first thing I have to say is, it reminded me of a bit of my own journey uh, in adopting, you know, even having a MetaMask wallet or buying NFTs or even being part of a DAO, right? And I remember hearing about the story of Bitcoin when it was probably at about, I don't know, a couple of hundred bucks or, a, you know, 600 or 800 but way sub thousand and the biggest barrier to entry for me to not have bought i don't know a thousand bitcoin at sub 1000 right was just because the process wasn't so simple it it was the the education the adoption at a consumer level even though i consider myself to be a tech savvy yep. guy right and the relevance of that, of what I'm trying to say here in context is when Apple phones came out or Apple Pay came out, right? They made it so easy to use, to be adopted that, you know, people who didn't have tech savvy had adopted it, you know, um, you know, with, with, with no afflictions or, 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 you know, looking at people in any negative manner, people over 75 who weren't really used to using smartphones are now using Apple Pay or Google Pay because it's so second nature at what point do you think this is going to be the case for the fundamental instruments that we use in this new world this completely this shadow infrastructure this parallel ecosystem effectively to creating which we're now calling web3 which is coming out of the darkness into the light and being legitimized in certain areas and Obviously, we'll go through some pains and be delegitimized by other people. How long do you think before the technology becomes so second nature that the conversation is not about the fundamentals of, you know, no no key, no private key, no Bitcoin? It just becomes everyone has it, and it's so easy to use. Where, how far away are we from that? Do you feel in the adoption cycles of technology? You've been there since the start of the phone. You've been the start of the platform. You've been there, e ink. What's your thought process or your idea if you were to chart yeah, a course. I don't, uh, you know. And it's an open topic. I'm not asking yeah, for a definite I answer. Really given it to a be fair. But I, <laughs> I guess what's, what's, what's interesting is um, five, I, I, I'm very pleased to, um, when I talk about Bitcoin in general today, uh, the knowledge of it is amazing compared, I remember five, three to five years ago where almost nobody was able to explain it, right? I think the amount of content and education that has been out there, people understanding what, you know, decentralization, what ledgers are, you know, what mining is, what, what, what a node is. I think the education around there is, is, is quite amazing. And of course, the rise of NFTs and that whole wave, you know, people starting to buy it, um, people starting to understand what's at stake when you have your private keys in an exchange that you get locked out from, right? You learn the hardware. But yeah, in, in terms of where we are at, like I would say, you know, maybe we're, you know, you know, 2000, you know, early 2000 of where the internet was um, for, for, for Web3. Um, you know, when, when is this simple kind of iPhone moment going to come? You know, I, I don't know. I think maybe we're three years away, right? Uh, only because um, wow, that's soon. Nobody, has, uh, nobody has really come out with a, you know, well, I'm starting to build this chip, right? Um, and 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 you need you need that as the foundation, right? Um, and then and then what kind of porting into a phone and 
and and and so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I I haven't really kind of thought through the timeline of it, um, but I'm just amazed at how much knowledge has spread already around just Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, right? The amount of kind of you know everyday know-how, um, and of course it it comes in waves. Um, so yeah, I, I would just say that uh, um, there still needs to be a lot of education for sure. Um, I, I wouldn't think that the average taxi driver that knows about NFTs uh, knows about private keys yet, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, it, it, it'll take time for sure. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, I, and yeah, you know, when, when you look at the other supporting part of adoption, right, it's infrastructure, correct? I mean, there was no smartphones, there's no Apple Pay. So the smartphone had to develop before I could have Apple Pay as a payment instrument. There was no payment off a phone when it wasn't a smartphone, let alone a QR code. Though the technology for QR and barcodes has existed forever, it's ironic that it, that QR code technology was adopted for payments on a smartphone. But that's a different conversation. What I'm trying to get at is infrastructure. And when you look at the way infrastructure is, has evolved, cloud computing, processing power, you know, on web three technology, if I can call it that, not even web two technology infrastructure, it's evolving at a, at a rapid pace. But essentially what's happening is like in web two, there's a creation of a brand new ecosystem, right? That requires a lot of bench strength development, everything else that's going on. Web three will probably require a lot more. Are we able to support these visions with the infrastructure? Can we keep up? I mean, I remember at one point, Ronit, maybe you can correct me, as we were in danger of, of breaching Moore's, Moore's law at one point, right? There was a concern that we weren't going to be able to do that anymore in terms of production and processing. I think it was four years ago or five years ago, there was a, there was a oh, no, we're not going to keep up with that moment. Do you think we're going to be able to keep up with the demand? On building it up the infrastructure how, to support okay, yeah, this, I yeah. think it depends on on like on the on the high end case. I think what you're talking about, like you know, super high fidelity, you know, three D immersion, you know, persistence yes. and things of that nature. I think the I mean the way I think about it is, you know, I, I'm not so concerned about that, right? You know, whether mm -hmm. it's bandwidth or persistence. I think what I, I'm back down to the basics again. What is the fundamental Lego block of digital ownership, right? What is the fundamental Lego block for a sovereign, a sovereign, a digital sovereign individual, right? Mm -hmm. And so, to me, the missing piece, the missing piece is just this: what I call the SPU, right? This chip that's dedicated uh, to empower the user to own and something in their digital world, right? Starting with your private keys, then it's your identity, then it's you know everything built around that. Right. Um, I think on the other end of what you're talking about in terms of, you know, 5G and persistence, I mean, that's that's not something I, uh, uh, you know, I I see as the core part of what a Web3 is. Right. Because Web3 is not ownership. Web3 is mostly about ownership rather than high fidelity, you know, presence immersion, the way kind of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg thinks about it. Right. You know, I'm, I, I, I. I, 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 you know, I have a different perspective on what's 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 the core fundamental building block here. And you know, addressing conversations when we we talk about you know privacy or security, the fundamental word that sits there is trust. Correct. I trust. I can recognize. I can track. I can trace. I can remain right. anonymous if I want to. I can be public mm -hmm. if I want to. Trust. Right. Yeah. Where do you think that as a fundamental for trust in the interactions is actually happening? Because I think the first adoptions really that happen with any new technology, like it happens was, I mean, Silk Road effectively, right? People that wanted to engage with each other in, in transactions, they happen, they don't happen, but that was the risk that they took, right? Because they wanted to remain yeah. anonymous, but they wanted that flow to happen outside of the infrastructure that's tracked or regulated today. Yeah. The reason people yeah, use regulated infrastructure today is because 
there needs to be a guardian effective, effectively for this trust network to work. Do you think yeah. there will be like the evolution of a DAO? You know, will there be more infrastructure trust that comes from the community? Or do you think there's going to be trust from the standing regulators and institutions that impose it on traditional infrastructure today? I'll say three things about trust. I think first is, is you know, um, which is part of what the open source movement was about, right? Um, everything, it's open, you know, Bitcoin is not just open source, right? It's open state, open runtime, right? That's what's amazing. Of it. It's completely transparent, right? And that builds trust, right? This whole idea of anybody can audit is an open audit, right? And um, I would say this idea of an SPU needs to have an open audit from a hardware standpoint. Now, that's a very disruptive concept for a semiconductor to have an open audit and open source hardware, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the second thing I, was, I would talk about, and you, 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 you talked about, you know, you know, anonymous, but I would say, uh, you know, uh, anonymity or, you know, pseudonymous, I think this idea of being able to be anonymous or pseudonymous is just as important as decentralization, right? Um, I don't know. I, I, have you been following, like, do you know what uh, Finsta is uh, versus Rinsta? No. Like, no. Finsta is your, your fake Instagram account, Finsta, right? Oh, and then you yep, have a okay. real Instagram. And then, but what's interesting is you can actually, you're actually, you can be more real in your Finsta account, right? Uh, it's, it's your family, and, you know, you can be who you are. Whereas your real Insta account, you know, you can easily get canceled if you say the wrong thing, right? And so there's this, you know, uh, there, it, it, it's fascinating to see that, it, and, and there needs to be some, um, uh, the, uh, the ability, especially when you put yourself out there in, in different social networks to be pseudonymous, to be protected from, from, from different, you know, groups, right? Um, digital Batman. <laughs> Yeah, or did yeah, you know, wear or, the or mask like, to protect my protect my identity, you know, or people that I know. Yeah, and then um, uh, the thirteen. What was the last thing you were talking about? Um, I'm talking about the the standing point of of guardianship or regulation to establish right? trust because yeah, it's it's not yes. only regulation, right? Just just to yes. clarify, yes, it's it's trust. going back to this element of trust because I trust technology. Yes. There's yes. I I but trust I, technology. I, I, it's just the people I don't yes. trust sometimes. Yes, but I, I would say that in this case, I would say Web2 companies actually did a, a, a pretty good job here because mm. in, in, you know, a regulated world, like what you want is, you know, protection from, you know, bad behavior, right? You want to have a good ratings, right? I would say the companies like Amazon and Uber and Yelp, that's what they, they did so well, on, right? They were able to get in amazing user reviews right? They were able to control and ban bad behavior, right? And hence, mm -hmm. they were able to build a lot of consumer trust, right? And so I would say that, you know, any regulatory body would, would can learn a lot from these Web2 companies that were able to crowdsource uh, user ratings and, 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 of course, protect the consumer, right? Um, and, um, and also, at the same time, you know, ban bad behavior, right? It sounds like a DAO, right? That's, a what, that's what DAOs do, right? I mean, a, a, a DAO effectively is self-governance, but governance by a pseudo-guardianship. Yeah, you have, diff you, you have different you governance know, within DAOs, right? But then you, you're, you're crowdsourcing ratings, right? Um, and then you're building on a reputation, right? And that reputation can be pseudonymous, right? It doesn't have to be linked to a real person, but it needs to be persistent from your from that particular username uh, in that particular social realm, right? Like when you have an Instagram account, people don't have to know who you as a real person is, right? But the reputation, you know, the things that you tweet or the thing that you post is attached to, you know, that, that pseudonymous uh, uh, identity, right? And you need to be able to own that. And you also need to be able to be pseudonymous, um, you know, in, in, in that space, right? And, and you need to build a reputation, right? To build trust um, um, for that. 
Okay. I think just a, a last question before I before I hand back uh, to Ronit. When you look at you know the adoption of technology and you look at the monetization, right? I mean, we've been talking about principle and we've been talking about hardware, we've been talking about software, we've been talking about infrastructure. I want to talk touch a little bit about commercialization revenue, right? Um, there's many things that are happening. There's fresh creation of wealth, right? I create a digital piece of art. I do the limitation. I make it. I make artificial scarcity to a point just like same principles of bitcoin and everything else and then i run it and i i'm creating value and the market is creating value for me as well right i'm not just you know i might launch an nft at 0.5 eth half an eth but the market demand says it's worth 200 afterwards because of scarcity but when you're looking at 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 this commercialization and wealth creation right there are two things that are happening there's i feel like there's a shift of existing wealth through securitization that's an eventuality which seems to be happening anyway from real estate to medical records to trades to transactions that seems to be trusting the infrastructure and ecosystem and that evolution is happening but this new creation of wealth that's happening the first people that rush to these new spaces are always advertising marketing agencies everything else right are we just going to see a bombardment of branding and everything else? Like I feel like we're already seeing, you know, invariably in this space, or are we actually going to see the rise of, you know, further of these people who have their own brands and their own YouTube channels and their own TikTok channels in Web three being able to push through and actually take center stage, uh, you know, from a wealth creation point of view? I don't know. What are you saying, or what do you think is going to happen in these? this ecosystem from a monetization. I would say community. that, you know, usually when a new, new kind of, you know, I, and I saw this in mobile, right? Um, and even in, in, in VR is there's this old medium and then there's new medium. Um, mm -hmm. And then people are, people who think in the old medium just say, oh, let me do the, the new medium version of it, right? And so it's, it's called, uh, there's a term for it called skeuomorphic design, right? You're taking old concepts uh, that you did in the old kind of medium and then you port it into the new medium. I would say most of the NFTs out there are, are that, right? They're not native to kind of a uh, uh, public blockchain, right? I would say that one of the, one of like, um, are you familiar with generative art? In, 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 yeah, I would yeah, say that generative art cool. is one of the, one of the few kind of, um, art pieces or art or, or um, applications that is native. It's a native kind of public blockchain application, right? Because it, it's a there's an understanding of algorithm. There's an understanding of you know locking something in a blockchain, right? And it's genuine art. Like the way I see somebody like Tyler Hobbs, for example, or Snowfro. Um, these are you know in in a, in, in a few years time we're going to see this. Wow, this is actually the first generation of artists in a completely new medium that has thought about this in a very native way, right? Yeah. Um, they're, they're not skeuomorphic in the sense that, oh, I'm just gonna port, you know, I'm just gonna do, you know, uh, real estate in, 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 in the virtual world. I'm not just gonna do, <laughs> you know, for my art piece. I'm not just gonna take a picture of, you know, this, 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 painting that I did and then store it on the blockchain, right? It's not fundamental, it's not native to that medium, so to speak, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I would, you know, I don't, I don't know what the killer app for NFTs are yet. I'm, I see that as one, um, but I also see that most of the, the NFT applications out there are still experimental and still skeuomorphic in that sense. And uh, Phil, thanks so much. I, I, you know, I did want to ask one more question, but I fear that Ronit is going to ask it. Am I? I, I don't know what you were going to ask, but um... the question I... I was going to ask is: Is the chip going to be open source? Oh. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask that, so you can ask. That. <laughs> yeah, is the you going to make the chip that you're designing open source? It has to be. Yeah, I think, and if, if cool. it's not. Um, I won't, uh, you won't be able to build the trust, right? And Very cool. I also, I also think that if you think about it, right, I think 
for example, the U.S. will come up with a secure chip. China will come up with a secure chip. Taiwan will come out with a secure chip. The question is, who's, who is the world going to buy from, right? Um, it, it, it's a clear <laughs> answer to me, right? I'll leave that to, uh, to, to Ronit. <laughs> Back to you, Ronit. Thanks, Phil. Just to wrap up, maybe switching from the chips to, to the um, commercialization question Gaur was asking, if you had to call out one or two companies today, either consumer or user front end, or the manufacturing end to say, hey, watch these companies. They, and of course, they might be companies you invested in, in which case do flag that. But to say, not from an investment perspective, just from they're building cool stuff that's gonna help grow and scale Web3. Who would, who would they be? Who would you call out, Phil? Uh, there's one company, which I'm a, a seed investor, they're called Denari. Uh, they're based in Silicon Valley. Denari? Um, yeah, they're basically kind of uh, Carta, but on a public blockchain, right? It's inter internet scale um, equity ownerships, right? Um, it allows, you know, people to, to own equity of companies um, um, in, you know, in a, in, in a public blockchain system, right? And so, um, yeah, I find that very fascinating. I think that's one of the kind of early ideas that, you know, the public blockchain should should have, um, you know, an, an internet scale, um, um, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, what do you call the, oh, it escapes me, um, a cap table, internet scale cap table. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I find that, except, yeah, that's one, one that jumps yeah. out. Right, right, right. And the final one, just to wrap up, in terms of what's already existing, what's there today. Oftentimes, so we've had this discussion for the last oh, almost 50 minutes, 45 minutes about um, the metaverse, the next generation of the internet and future, future driving chips and so on. And, um, but that phrase, that word, the word skeuomorphic, you skeuomorphism. And I look at these virtual lands out there. People say, often they conflate Metaverse with virtual land. I'm not picking on any one particular land or pushing any one particular land, but the ones that are more popularly known, so a sandbox or a decentraland and so on. And again, this is not meant to be a pump or a critique of any one particular land, but how would you think of that category as a whole, Phil? I mean, is that is that the metaverse or is it some kind of, I don't know. Um, That's geomorphic. In my example, that's a classic right? example yeah. of skeuomorphic. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to get my head around why I need to recreate Central, a like Hong Kong Central, and the scarcity value and the obscene property prices in Central with um, this virtual land. Because um, I don't know, it's <laughs> yeah, this is the I mean, first generation of like those cars that look like basically buggies without horses. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows Ronit. <laughs> so I'm asking Phil. He's got a galaxy brain, so let's you know. <laughs> Come on, Phil. This is your test. What's the What's the question, though? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> is why? Why is These it virtual lands? Like, what are oh. they? Is it like, are they like? Are they like the, you know, the first generation of the cars that look like buggies without horses? Or I think it's more like. You know when 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 um uh, the video camera the film camera was invented right yeah and the radio show uh, was what everybody was all America was listening to yeah and the first TV show um, wasn't you know you know people acting in front of a camera mm -hmm. it was literally pointing a camera at people talking mm -hmm. you know on a radio show yeah. Although what's fascinating is we've come full circle to do, be doing that in podcasts, the video podcast, right? But the early idea of a film or a movie yeah. um, was simply, you know, it was a, what, because radio shows were, were, the, were, were the, you know, most popular thing, right? And now mm -hmm. this thing, this new TV medium, and now I'm just going to port this radio show on video. And that's yeah. the new kind of, 
you know, know we should be, right? We should be sitting here like doing a radio show. We should be doing TikTok dances or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and so, but you know, uh, you know, obviously the film industry has taken off in a completely different trajectory. And, you know, camera and and you know different types of storytelling. Um, although we've come full circle in podcasts and video podcasts now, and they're just pointing uh, video cameras at people talking. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I would say I would liken it to that. You know, it's skeuomorphic in that sense. Um, but it takes years for people to be native and grow up in a completely new medium to think what's actually unique about this, what's scarce, right? Uh, in this and what's what's the value adding um, part in this new media right mm -hmm. um and so i i don't i don't, i don't pretend to have figured that out uh, but um, i'm excited to find out let's watch this space we've gone way over our schedule time so we I have think. my god um, Very cool. thank you so much for joining us uh it's been a pleasure to have you again on this conversation and Look forward to this uh, next generation chip. super secret chip to be built. Oh, yeah, Open indeed. I want to. I want to come to the factory and see it. I want to do a tour. Field trip. Let's sure. do a field trip to Taiwan. I really love. I love seeing production. I love seeing processes. I love that. So that would be super cool. And if it's That's open good. source anyway, we can video and do our next podcast there. That's, That's right. right. We can do it, and then we can put it in the metaverse. Yeah. There you go. Funding Thanks, program guys. for the chip. All Thank right. you so Thanks much, Will. Thanks, Will. Thanks, 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 Thanks